there are a lot of ways to do that. One of the most important ways is to learn the outward rules of it very well and to adhere to them in the same way that you would when you first learn to drive. When you first learn to drive, it's very troublesome because you're so you know, conscious of the rules, especially if you have the teacher next to you. But at a certain point, it all just becomes... It's just what you do. So initially, being obsessed with the rules is problematic because you're so focused on the rules, you can't really focus on the spirit of the prayer. But it's, that's a necessary stage of prayer. So learning the rules really well until they really become second nature. And then you begin to work on your spiritual presence in the prayer. And part of that has to do with the amount of dhikr that you do during the day. And that's why the more dhikr you do, the better your prayer. And also wudu is very important. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, your presence in your wudu determines your presence in the prayer. And one of the things that people do is they do wudu very hastily and very ritualistically so that their wudu is no longer an act of worship. And one of the best things that I ever was exposed to was watching Murat al-Hajj do wudu because it really hit home the first time I saw it. It is a deep act of worship, wudu. And we tend to forget that. Wudu is actually part of prayer. It's a very deep act of worship. So being present in wudu, not doing wudu in a bathroom is really important too. Not doing it where the toilet is. Doing it in a place that's... Uh, I mean, there's other things. There's the, one of the things Sidi Ahmed Sarruq says, saying before you start your prayer, Qur'a'udhu barabbin nas, mirkin nas, ilahi nas, before you actually go into the prayer, just to remove the waswasa and get out of that. And, I mean, the prayer is one of the proofs of Iblis, because right when you do takbir, sometimes, the weirdest things just, and you, why did that suddenly come into my mind? I mean, that is that component that's working. It's very interesting. Literally, you do takbir and whoosh. Tasawwuf is one of the words that's used to describe the science of ihsan. It's, it's the inner fiqh. You have an outer fiqh and you have an inner fiqh. So that's all it is. It's an inner fiqh. And just like you have fuqaha that are wrong in their outward rules, you have people of tasawwuf that are wrong in their inward. So that's... Part of the problem is people just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because there's people of Tasawwuf that went way out there and they're just, they're called Ghuda to Sufiya. And then you have extremist Sufis and you have extremist Fuqaha. Oh, what I was going to say is that in the West, one of the reasons that you have so much perversion in sexuality is because people are so removed from their bodies. Sex becomes a very mental thing that their experience of sex is all mental and that has to do with it's a disease so they want perverse sex because they cannot just experience a natural experience of being in the body very strange but you don't have that in in traditional cultures where people are very much in their bodies you don't have perverted sex i guarantee you more times they can't even understand it they can't it just doesn't they don't understand it I mean, I, they don't even understand sodomy. It's just, it's to, you know, they don't have where Murab al-Hajj is. They, one faqih told me when he went to the Emirates, he told me when he was studying in Mauritania, he thought that sodomy was like, he said he used to really be troubled by all this stuff about pedophilia and sodomy and the books of fiqh. He thought it was really strange. And uh, he said he thought it was all theoretical possibilities that the fuqaha were trying to ex- exhaust all the possibilities but he just he said he didn't think that it was in the world he, he thought that Qawm Lut was a group of people and that was it until he went to the east and then he was like really shocked but that's aboriginal peoples aboriginal peoples tend not to have uh, those types of perversions what you were going to say uh, Ahmad it's the name of the prophet sallallahu in the hadith, why is the pillars described before faith? I mean, part of it, Islam, obviously the first rukan of Islam is shahada. And obviously that comes out of faith. So faith, in a sense, precedes Islam. But you can enter into Islam and your faith is, is very uh, immature and undeveloped. 
So faith is something that comes out of practice. It's developed through practice. If the practice is done properly, I mean, there's some Muslim countries, I don't want to mention names, but there's Muslim countries where, I mean, it's just, it's like hypocrisy is a norm where people do these outward perfunctory rituals that have no impact on their uh, spiritual uh, reality at all. And I mean, you can see the most horrendous examples of hypocrisy and people that are pray and fast and do everything. So it's no, it's no guarantee. Any other question? Did you? You already asked your question. Mm-hmm. Oh, the other reason was during the Mamluk period, slaves actually became rulers. So it was actually, a, they saw that as a fulfillment of that prophecy. Riya, which is spiritual showing off. It's doing an act of devotion, in other words, to God, hoping that people see it for whatever reasons. I mean, Riya is definitely more significant in a religious society. We have showing off, which is if somebody's a good horseman, you know, and they see some people, they'll do a fancy jump. And that's not Riya. That's just showing off. Riya is when you do an act that should be done for God, but you're doing it for other people to say, what a generous person, what a brave person. What a, that's Riya. And there's two types of Riya. There is the type which is only for the people, which is the worst type. In other words, you don't even care about God. So you give charity just so people say he's a generous man. The other is where you genuinely want to do something for God, but you find this desire. And that's something people have to struggle with. And Imam Madik was asked about a man on the way to a mosque who, when he set out from his house, he set out solely for the sake of God. But on the way, he's hoping somebody might see him. And he said that I hope that his original intention is, what he was saying is it's human nature, that element exists. There's a famous story of a man who used to go to the prayer. He was in the first line every single day for 40 years before the prayer. And one day he went and uh, he missed the opening takbir and he didn't want people to see him. And he realized that he'd had that riyah for 40 years. And in the story that's told, they said he made up his prayers for 40 years at home. (laughs) I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's the meaning's nice. I mean, it's just letting you know that there's a lot of subtle levels there that we're not even aware of. And that's part also of spiritual development. And that's why they say, Hasanat al-Abrar, Sayyat al-Muqarrabin. The good actions of righteous people are wrong actions for people in divine presence. And that's why each maqam that you move to, you start saying, Astaghfirullah for the previous maqam because you realize how wrong, how many things you were doing wrong, things that you thought were right. When you get to a higher level of awareness, you realize, you know, I, I was doing it for the wrong reason. So it's a journey. That's why it's called path, <laughs> the journey. It's a journey, and may Allah cause us to realize arrival, inshallah. I mean, I wanted to go over some concepts for people to understand about jihad because probably of all the topics related to Islam, the two most common misconceptions I would say are probably those concerning jihad and those concerning women. And so most of the attacks on Islam generally tend to focus on those two elements. So I'd like to talk about this first from what he mentions in the book. He mentions that the idea of holy war is misleading and it's an inaccurate translation. Jihad, holy war in Arabic, if you did have a word for it, and the Arabs actually don't, uh, would be harb muqaddasa or something like that. And the Arabs don't have a concept of holy war in that way. In fact, it's actually a Christian concept and coming out of... Uh, the just war concept and the crusades. So the word in Arabic that is used and has in fact become an English word 
sometimes with a negative connotation, other times with a positive. It's been used both ways by journalists and other people. Jihad comes from a root word which is jihad or juhud, which has the idea of exerting energy. When you say somebody, he exerted his utmost ability. And so the idea behind the word jihad, and jihad is known as a verbal noun or a masdar from jahada yujahidu. The Quran says, wujahidhum bihi jihadan kabira. Struggle against them with it, with the Quran, a great jihad, a great struggle, which means argue with the polytheist using the Quran as the weapon of argumentation against polytheism. Because the Quran, although it never proves the existence of God, it is constantly focusing on the unity of God. And so the idea was to use the arguments that the Quran presents for the oneness of God in order to explain to the people who believed in more than one God that there was one God. So that is a type of jihad in the Quran. That that's a great jihad. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ and the Quran says, struggle with them with your wealth and with yourselves. And also it says to the Prophet ﷺ, said to fight with them with your tongues. In other words, argumentation. And in fact, Argumentation not being disputation, or, but rather a civil debate or civil discourse. Because the Prophet ﷺ, if he, a conversation became heated, he would withdraw. The Prophet ﷺ did not engage in argumentation as disputation, but rather in civil debate or discourse, where we sit down and we try to look at a problem and from both sides. And so you put your proofs forward, the other person puts his proofs forward, and you attempt to convince somebody of a superior way. That's a civil discourse, and that's jihad bil-lisan. The Quran, when it says, ادعو إِرَى سِبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِذَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ وَجَادِرْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنَ And dispute with them in an excellent way, which is civil discourse, using intelligence, and using reason. Now the interesting thing is, is that war is actually when that breaks down. In other words, coercive force is what is used when people are not able to speak to each other in any civil way. So war is actually a collapse of intelligent discourse. And that's why, in essence, it's a very stupid thing. War is an incredibly stupid thing. And that's why the Qur'an tells us not to be aggressors, because the nature of the aggressor is he's somebody who is unable to obtain what he wants civilly, so he resorts to other ways, violent means, to getting what he wants. And those type of people usually want the wrong things, things that aren't theirs. And that's why the essence of conflict generally has to do with one person or one group of people aggressing on another group of people. And so what happens is, one side is aggressed on and the other side is an aggressor. The people that are aggressed upon are the people in the Qur'an that are permitted to fight. And this is why at the essence of physical or martial combat, and, and that's why when we look at jihad, we have to look at it from three, there are three Qur'anic concepts. The first is mujahidatun nafs, that of struggling against the self. The idea that there's an internal conflict going on so that you actually have to struggle with yourself. And part of struggling with yourself is struggling with the passions. And the passions, again, are what? Your bestial nature. And so what you struggle that with is with your reason. And that is why when somebody is attempting not to do something that is wrong and struggle against those impulses, what he's using is a higher power. And the higher power is reason, is the aql. And that's why the essence of intellect in Arabic means that which constrains you or which prevents you from doing something that will lead you astray. Aqala ya'qilu means to, to stop, to prevent. And the other Arabic word they use for uh, intellect is nuha, which comes from that which refuses or that which prevents. Again, yanha. All right. So the intellect, the essence of the intellect is that it prevents a human being from going astray. Now those people that don't listen to the intellect, 
Uh, Allah says about them, in whom kill an'am, they're like animals. But then He says, Badhum adal, they're even more astray. And the reason for that is because animals do not do things that harm them. If an animal knows there's harm in something, it will avoid it. If an animal sees fire, it will flee from the fire. If an animal sees something that threatens it, it will either defend itself if it doesn't see any other venue, or if it, by its nature, uh, the threat is something that it deems within its power, like a lion, if it's threatened by a lesser animal, aggressive animal, the lion will tend to fight because it's a lion and it knows that it can overpower. So